month-long 620-kilometer canoe journey through Canada's Côte Nord region, an area notoriously known for its rugged landscapes and wild rivers. The goal of this trip is to descend the mysterious Agonish River, and in doing so, connect Western Labrador to the Gulf of the St. Lawrence. The route is going to have many challenges, both physical. We are literally portaging over a mountain. And mental. We're going to be alone in a very remote area, which means we're going to have to be self-sufficient and know what to do if things go wrong. It really snapped right in half. A trip like this takes a lot of prep and planning. We spent the last few months refining our route, organizing gear, updating our first aid kit, and working on our skills so that we'll be well prepared for what's to come. The adventure will start at the Orway train station, and from here we'll travel east for two weeks across the expansive Labrador Plateau to reach the crest of the ancient Laurentian mountain range. From here, we'll cross the height of land into Quebec, where we'll be waiting for a special delivery and then descend the mountainous Agoniche River 260 kilometers to the coastal village of Agoniche. Matt and I have spent the entire day driving and ferry hopping from Halifax, Nova Scotia to Septile, Quebec. Tomorrow, we'll take the Tuatin rail line another 300 kilometers north to be dropped off at our starting point. If all goes well, we'll be out in 30 days. What is going on, everyone? Hey. Hey. Hello, hello. What's going on, Aguaniche crew, expedition crew, and also hello to uh, all the people that have already joined on with us here. We're really excited to have uh, some time here to answer some of your questions that we've been getting in about the trip and uh, kind of do a little bit of a debrief after the whole video series is out and uh, get the get the band back together. I think this is the first time the four of us have been on a video chat. Yeah, we didn't trip. even do a debrief. We didn't even do a debrief. We Had did to not save the thoughts till now. Yeah. Yes, this, this is, is raw. For us as well. This is raw. This is organic. So, awesome. Eric, where are you? Where are you coming in from? Coming in from Las Vegas, Nevada, right now. I'm. Uh, I'm at a conference for work, so I. Was able to squeak away and uh and we're here so happy to be here i can't promise i'll be here for the entire time so get your questions in right at the beginning i already see one that says eric has hair again exclamation i have hair again yeah the flow is back <laughs> it's thicker too it's better hair the hair is better now yeah, i think yeah. that's the best story of, the, of this entire trip was is your hair hair loss and then your hair gain yeah. So as you guys know, I've been canoeing a lot with the Northern Scavenger guys. And uh, the more canoe trips I go on with them, the less hair I end up having. So I said to myself, this is the last canoe trip I'm ever going to do with them. And then my hair came back. So <laughs> that's the, if you want hair, just don't go canoeing with Alex or Noah. So funny. Yeah. And I think you mainly have Matt to thank for that. Cause he was the one reminding you yeah, every, Matt, morning, every night yeah. to take your uh, hair pills. <laughs> yeah. So, so for context, I, I had alopecia, so I had beautiful hair, beautiful beard. And, uh, and then I woke up one day and it was all gone. Right. So then I was sporting the Mr. Clean look. I even started working out. I was getting jacked. It was good. I was comfortable in my own skin. And then I started taking these pills and about six to eight months later, I have hair again. This this happened probably in around January, February, and now it grew back and it grew back quicker. So thank you to the hair pills and thanks Matt for reminding me to take my hair pills. <laughs> got, got your back, buddy. We'd love to see it. Uh, all right. Well, why don't we uh, dive straight in here and uh, start taking some uh, some questions? So Alex, do you want to lead this this first question for the uh, the group here? 
Uh, well, yeah, I can just pop one in here. And if one of you guys, so was the weather what you expected in hindsight? Uh, would you have chosen a different time of year to go? I can answer what do you think, Noah? Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Hannah, for that question. So if you guys have watched the Boreal to Barrenland strip we did in 2019, it pretty much rained every day. And leading up to this trip, I think we, we all expected something similar. I remember telling Matt beforehand, like, get ready for rain every day. And for the first two weeks, it was so hot up there. It was probably about 25 degrees in sun. So we were not expecting that, but it was definitely a good surprise. Yeah, that definitely was not at all what I expected. The second two weeks were probably more in line with my expectations, like just a mix. Uh, and we definitely got more rain in that second two weeks. But yeah, the first two weeks of hot, tropical, sunny weather were not expected. Yeah. But it was I would say for, um, for, for those big lake crossings we had to do because, as you guys know, crossing big water is one of the, the biggest dangers of these trips. And we got so lucky with, with almost class lake conditions up there. And it, it, we could have been stuck on, on one of those lakes for, for multiple days, which would have added to the logistical complications of meeting up with Alex and Eric uh, on day 17. I, I would honestly say that there's no complaints on my end from the weather. I think like it was almost half and half in terms of sunny days and uh, and wet days. And it was nice that the sunny days and the sunny nights, the nice evenings we had just happened to fall on times we found beach campsites. So that was nice. Yeah, those lined up nicely. I got another one yes, here, uh, Noah, uh, on uh, just the route, uh, how you chose the route. Um, and I figured that was a good one for now. Yeah, so, so I, I think we all had interest in this area, Cote Nord. And so the big thing was we have Alex and Eric who are in Ontario, and then Matt and I who were in Halifax, Nova Scotia. So we wanted to find a route that was equal sort of distance for all of us that we could all meet at. So we were focused on Quebec, and we wanted to explore a new area. And Cote Nord is full of these wild rivers. That uh, There's the Romaine, which is now dammed up, and then, but then you have the Moise, um, there, there's a lot there. And then I spent a couple of times uh, just, just going over a map and looking at, at different rivers there. And then this river, the Agunish, really caught my interest because of, of how defined it was on a large map, but the little amount of information that we could find on it. And that sort of started the, uh, the curiosity train to uh, do this river. There were some good practical reasons for it too, though, with COVID restrictions as well, not needing to access any, uh, like any remote communities that would have had further restrictions so there's some, some practical reasons too for taking that route definitely um so we've got another one here were you guys ever close to having to call on the sat phone to get picked up midway trip um i don't think on this trip we ever really got to that point but obviously uh this person has seen some of our previous trips where that was maybe a little bit more of a close call but no, we didn't. Really I, I, I remember I remember being at the top of the mountain in the portage. And I remember just being like, well, we might be here for a couple of days. Like what happens if something happens? Are we going to have to like just call in and get like helicoptered out of here? But then I was just like, we're going to have to saw through a landing pad anyways. So like it's either saw to the river or saw a landing pad. So was it, did, I, mean, I don't even think we had the choice at some points in the trip. We've got another one here. What month did we do the trip? Uh, so it was done in July last year. So July, 2021. Uh, how was the first craft beer after getting off the river? Anyone want to explain what our after river scenario looked like? Cause I, I seem to recall there not being any beer. I think our after yeah, was. Trip scenario was, was uh, getting in a car, driving three hours, sleeping in a gravel pit, and then driving like 18 more hours the next day or something like that. Luxury. Yeah. Luxury. <laughs> there might have been a beer at the gravel pit. I feel like we stopped for beer somewhere there. So that was pretty good. No, we, we had a beer by the car because as soon as we, uh, we got off the river, there was people there greeting us. And they gave us uh, some smoked salmon, like homemade smoked salmon, which is unbelievable. So before we took off, I think we all split like one warm beer that was in the car for like two weeks. And then we had to smoke salmon. 
I would say that smoked salmon definitely was, was just as good. That was so Oh, tasty. my God. That was pretty top-notch. That, that was, was the very best generous. craft beer I've ever had. <laughs> very generous of them to bring that out for us. We've got another one here. Can you tell us more about the canoes you used? Do you want to take this one more? Yeah. So the canoes we use are a Skiff Canyons. So a Skiff is a brand out of is a brand in Quebec, and they make these products that are made out of T Formex. And T Formex is a material that for us works perfectly. It, it's a little heavy, but it's pretty much bomb proof. The boat that Matt and I used was the same boat we dragged across Labrador in 2019. And we've really, really beat these boats up and they still continue to perform. And then the reason we use the model of a canyon is canyons are almost like a they're cane birds so it's shaped like a banana consider and a, a prospector is more is more standard and having a banana shaped boat is really good for maneuvering on rapids and being on a being on the agro niche we really wanted to we, we maneuverability was very important for us so we we thought this would be a perfect boat and it turned out it was the perfect boat for us for this and we had two of them Yeah, we hit our line every time. <laughs> every time. <laughs> Didn't hit a rock the whole trip. Not one. Though I may have to retire that boat after that last trip we did. Um, so are there certain permits to travel this land, fish and eat the fish, not just release? Who do you get them from? Thanks, an awesome series. Thank you. Do you want me to jump in on this one? Yeah, cool. I, think, I think that was my department in the research. Yeah, go for it, Matt. Um, I mean, there, so there's there's many regions in each province because the, the trip took place across Labrador and Quebec. And then there's different regions with different regulations within each of those provinces. But in general, uh, I mean, I think people probably commented that you didn't see a lot of fishing in the first half of the trip. And that's because we were in Labrador and in that part of Labrador. Um, we uh, we couldn't get licenses to fish there but then in quebec the parts of quebec we were in it's just a standard fishing license stop and pick it up at the gas station on the way there and then for the last 30 kilometers of the river was uh you would need a special salmon license so we didn't finish the last 30 kilometers of the rivers but i mean well that, that's about alex, alex and i actually had those oh uh, yeah those salmon licenses because we were ambitious we're like on the drive out we're gonna go fly fish every single river we're gonna we're gonna catch salmon I was I was gonna come back with like ten salmon, fill my fridge, but we didn't. We that didn't happen at all. So, all right, we got another one here. Great trip. Any plans to run the Catawagami again? Um, I was hoping to see you cross the bay. So I I don't think we've got any plans anytime soon. Uh, thanks for watching that video series though, for sure. Uh, but that's not to say that we might not venture up that way again uh, in the future, but just probably not the same river. I would definitely say bucket list item is to to paddle that that like little piece across to Moose Knee. We we are definitely disappointed not to, <laughs> to paddle that for sure. <laughs> this question's jokes. This is a good question. <laughs> I'm gonna yeah, let Noah yes. take this one. <laughs> Noah had the ultimate solution for this. Noah has the ultimate solution. So is chafing a problem? Yes. But not um, for him. <laughs> so yeah. so on, on this past trip, I, I uh, discovered gold bond, gold bond powder. And a little bit, a little bit each day keeps everything smooth and, and uh, feeling good. So yeah, you definitely want to reduce that friction with a powdered substance. <laughs> Great job, Noah. And, and it's also it's 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 minty fresh too. So, <laughs> it's choked. All right, do you guys see a a photo or a question you want to take? Yeah. So so, Alice, how do we start them, or, or are you or are you the manager? You can't right? start them. That was that was what we were saying before. Tell me the name and the time that they commented at, and I can pop it up on screen. Do you just want us to call it out? Yeah, that's I mean, uh, Hannah Hancock at 704 on the repair job on the canoe. I mean, that's probably a good question to answer. 
Yeah, repair so, job on the canoe. So the repair job, the, the black fly repair job, that is still on the canoe and, and we've been using it every weekend here in Nova Scotia and it still works just fine. So those black flies have made their way all the way back down to Halifax. <laughs> all right, so how are the logistics for getting home from the Agua Niche? And I'd say getting home was a lot easier than getting there um getting getting there matt and noah had had driven to septiel and then taken the train north matt left his car in septiel and had shipped me his car key a month before the trip and eric and i drove in one vehicle to septiel picked up his car and then drove it the final distance to uh natashquan actually where we flew out from so all the cars were in Natashquan, which is just a short 15, 20 minute drive from Aguaniche. And we actually kind of had some plans in the back of our mind if we had made it to the town of Aguaniche in time that we would have paddled to uh, Natashquan, but we did not have that time available to us. So we actually just, when we got to that road at the end of the series, you can kind of hear some people honking. Eventually someone stopped and we, and we were able to flag them down to actually get a ride uh, over uh, the town over uh, so that we could get our cars. And then it was just uh, all of us heading home kind of the same way that we came back. It's a long drive for us coming from Toronto and, and also from uh, Halifax. So we have a double question here from two people from Leanne 717. What time is that? 717. Six. Oh, you guys have it an hour oh, ahead. That's why. Yeah, this is AST, yeah. buddy. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's 317 for me. So the, the yeah. question is, do you ever get on each other's nerves? No one wants to answer. <laughs> no, not really. Yeah, I, no, I would say. I, I, go ahead, Eric. No, I was gonna say I I don't think we did. I maybe I'm biased, but you guys didn't piss me off. So <laughs> you pissed me off. <laughs> <laughs> we we were all just talking smack about you behind your back when you fell asleep. <laughs> yeah, I, I would say we didn't really have any arguments, and uh, yeah, there, and, there was and, one and, set of rapids that we disagreed on. I I, I remember yeah. that one. We we did not necessarily agree on that set, but. We got yeah, over that it, was one know? where I think we all looked at it and then we all had a different idea of how it should be done. And then we all agreed, okay, well, if we can't agree, that's probably not a good idea. Yeah, but it took us a while. To, it took us a while to get to that point. Like it was like an hour yeah. standing there looking at the set of rapids and then we were all in different directions. So it was like, let's just not run this one. Yeah. Yeah. Because one per person will be right and three will be wrong. Yeah. Also, just doing a shout out. Hi, Leanne. My mom's out there visiting right now, so I uh, that that's likely them tuning in. Uh, did the power supply survive that got drenched early in the trip? And the answer to that is yes, it did survive. So Noah poured a, a solid amount of uh, water out of that bag, and it uh still turns on so that's a good sign yeah 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 i felt pretty bad after that um yeah yeah we we're very lucky that, that worked I, I just didn't want to tell you alex that hey <laughs> welcome to the trip <laughs> i uh i broke a thousand dollar uh external hard drive yeah uh dave sorry. green in the comments there what's going on dave night of adventure Quick plug, Night of Adventure, speaker series here in Halifax, Nova Scotia. Dave Green from the Labrador trip has been running this for nine seasons, crazy enough. And Matt is going to be presenting at this in a couple of weeks. Hey, Dave. I see a great hey, double Dave. whammy question here. So Yo, what do you see? Well, what's the question, Matt? 
So there's a great, there's two questions that go really well together. So at 714 at AST, MS Estito asks, what would have been the worst thing to lose while on this canoe trip? And then uh, Michael and Madalena asked, what was the backup plan if you had experienced something major? And I guess my thought would have been the worst thing to lose would have been this guy. And that was because of what our backup plan was, because if we lose this, the trip's over. If you guys want to what talk if, about what it. What if we lost a canoe, though? Well, yeah. Maybe. <laughs> no, wait, no. if we if we lost that, how would the trip be over? Because the only way to end the trip is to call through that. Well, no, that that, that ties into like sort of the backup plan. Uh, because in three days, if we don't communicate on that. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Oh, yeah. Why don't you, you elaborate wanna, on that? That's kind of your guys thing. Do you want to go through that? Yeah, so. Like emergency plan. Yeah, yeah the so the emergency plan, plan is, uh, so the emergency plan was we had the satellite phone and at the end of each day, we would message our, um, our designated person back home, which uh, it was my, my dad. And then also Alex's mom. And if they didn't hear from us after three days, they were instructed to, uh, reach out to a specific emergency contact based on where the last message was because we're traveling a decent distance. So in the upper trip, uh, the closest emergency would have been Labrador, I think Labrador city. Yeah. Lab city would have been closest up there. Yeah. And then when we were on the Agonish, it would have been, um, uh, somewhere down on, on code Nord. So, so if, so the thing is, if, if we just happen to lose our, our satellite fo- phone, just on a portage or something silly, a helicopter would be coming to, to find us in three days regardless even if we were totally fine so so making sure we, di- we didn't lose that that sat phone was was crucial for this trip and for us to communicate with each other to actually meet up yes uh we have a question from allison heather matt and noah important question very important question what beers are you guys drinking right now? Do you want to go first? So I am drinking a, um, a it's a pretty funny name, uh, Uncle Giggles. <laughs> it's an APA from Good Robot. Uh, Good Robot is a is a brewery here in Nova Scotia, and they actually just gave us a bunch of beer uh, for our next trip. So shout out to Good Robot. Appreciate the love. And if you guys are around, you should get a Good Robot too. And I've got a big, oh, wrong way. Big Spruce Brewing, Tim's IPA from up in Cape Breton, Nova Scotia. Okay. I'm also going to bring this up because I feel like I got brought the best beer today. This is the first beer. Oh my gosh. I don't know how to do this right now. <laughs> this is the first, this is the beer we flew into you guys. That was a delicious beer. I felt like it was. It was apropos to, to bring it out on the on the live tonight. We got one here. Any problems getting a float plane to carry a canoe? I've heard they're not allowed to carry canoes outside the plane. We didn't have any issue. I haven't heard of that, actually. I don't know if well, that Bo, Bo Bad did it. On, on the type of plane. Um, but, uh, yeah, that we didn't have any problems. And, uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't actually heard of any problems before. Um, outside of the ribs, what was the best meal? That, uh, when we camped at that really nice fishing hole where it was just brook trout after brook trout and we had that great meal of brookies and and soup, that was a pretty good meal. Uh, we actually had a question on overall, how was the fishing on the egg niche? And that kind of leads well into that. Uh, come see, come see. Come see. Mezzo and mezzo. Yeah. Some areas were really good. Like we, went some, we went through some really good pockets, but then we went through, and then, I don't know, like we'd throw our line in here and there, but we also had some days where we were like really hustling and bustling. So I wouldn't say that we necessarily put in a enough in some of the areas to really deem it not good. Yeah, it it, it is pretty pretty crazy like we we do go into these remote areas that have potentially really good fishing but sometimes we're so focused on other things that 
that getting out the fly rod and setting up a fly, it's, if it's windy, it just sort of doesn't become a priority unless we're hungry and we're, and we're fishing for keeps. So it's one of those things. It's we go to these spots to fish, and then when we're there, we're we're, we're doing other stuff. And I think it's different with the river trip too, because if you're lake paddling, you can throw it a line and troll, right? But this is primarily river tripping, so we had to intentionally stop what we're doing to fish, and I think that's why we didn't do that that often. Yeah. Um. Here's a good one here. So, anything with your gear you would have changed or left out? I would have changed for a better whitewater paddle. <laughs> I would have brought better or two. shoes. And you guys uh, I, no, I don't know. I was pretty comfortable the entire time. I would say my dry pants are probably going to be incinerated after uh, after this trip. But besides that, I think uh, you know, it was spot on. Alex? Um, I don't think I, I don't think I would actually have anything. I, I think I was okay. I saw a question here that uh, I would be interested in hearing Madden noise. Uh, okay, let's do this one first, and then we'll do that one. And then we'll jump to yours, yeah, sure. Also, I see one here asking if you can ask questions in French. Uh, I think that Matt only Matt's our our most French speaking member here, and it goes simple conversation, I think, only, right, Matt? Like how yeah. to how to order an egg McMuffin, how to find a coffee in a hotel for the night, <laughs> how to hitchhike. Say like we need to get to the task one. That's yeah, true. The uh, the two women that picked us up. The two women that picked us up to drive us from Aguaniche to Natashquan spoke mainly French. And so I was I was very much not a part of that conversation. <laughs> Uh, with the trip as long as a month, did you ever think you were going to be low on food? No. No. So, so we passed. <laughs> so, so the the only reason we'd be low on food is that we lost a bear barrel down the river, or or a bear or a bear took it. Because before this trip, we we strategized on how many calories um, we we need to take on our trip. Shout out to Dave Green for for uh, introducing us to this to this idea. But we, we set up our food that each day, each of us were, were to eat a, about 3,000 calories. And it, it, it works out that one 60 liter bear barrel is enough food for two people for two weeks. So because of that, we had three bear barrels, um, two for Matt and me, and then one for Alex and Eric. And it, we knew we would survive on just on just that food and we didn't have to catch any fish like we might have lost some weight uh matt cut, matt lost a couple of lbs on that trip but we knew we weren't going to starve to death out there that was looking good thanks buddy <laughs> yeah and we totally if we had lost a barrel i feel like we really could have stretched the food that we had too because we yeah. definitely had extras I got a question here. Uh, Levi Hoffman, 324 or uh, 624. And it reads, I remember you mentioned that you developed various habits after about three weeks. What are those habits? And that's for Noah and Matt. So I, I think uh, Matt definitely add to this. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is our routine out there. It, it takes about a week for you to really dial in your routine and kind of get used to um, the different the different things you have to do each day. And then I forget where I read this, but apparently you can you can gain you can like you can quit smoking after three weeks of doing something consistent. You you can after three weeks that's sort of apparently the time where these habits uh, that you've started actually become more consistent with, with like your lifestyle. And when we're every day we're doing the same thing, uh, you, you wake up. And you make a fire after doing that for three weeks you start feel like it feels weird not to have that in your routine each day yeah definitely and then too with um with just gear like everything finding its place 
after a while, like in the first few days, I found, you know, you go to go to bed and then you're in and out of the tent three times because you forget something you need or, but then after time, you just know exactly what you need at what times when you pack the bags, everything goes back in in the same order and it all just becomes like, you don't even think about it. It's all just routine and you really sink into that after a while. Um, we've got a question about where we are all from. Um, I thought we could do a quick round table and someone also asked what we do for work. So like maybe just go in a circle and say where you're from and uh, what you do for work. Yeah, I'll kick nice. it off. Uh, okay, okay. Right, yeah, nice. yeah, sure. Okay, I'm from Toronto, uh, and I do partnerships, like sales for a tech company downtown Toronto. Hence why I'm at a conference right now. Alex. And I, I'm Alex, uh, born and raised in Toronto, still living here now, and uh, I work in marketing in the healthcare industry. Uh, yeah, so I grew up in a small community just outside Halifax, and I, uh, I live in Halifax now. And I'm a civil engineer. I do uh, water and wastewater treatment plant design. So I grew up also in Toronto, Ontario. Alex and I have been friends since we were four years old or something crazy like that. And I moved out. I moved out to Halifax, Nova Scotia, about four years ago. And here I am a, uh, a geologist, and I work for this. Matt and I work for the same company, and we're, we're lucky enough to work for a company that allowed us to take a month off. Uh, it, it, it's incredible that that they've been so so open and encouraging to to uh, to allow this for us. But yeah, pretty cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you're a geologist. We get it. <laughs> Specializes uh, in the uh, the Grenville province, I hear. <laughs> so we've got a few here on uh, the filming. So, um, so I think we can do a combo here. So this one from Travis says, you guys have been at this a while and I love all the vids. Tell us about uh, some of the work that goes into filming and producing a series like this. And then we also have a question here um, on, oh, I just lost it. Something about, uh, oh, uh, this one here. Any points on this trip where you found it difficult to keep filming? Um, so yeah, Noah, Noah, do you want to start us off? Uh Yes. Sorry. What was the first question? The first one was uh, just about the process. So yes, it's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's a lot of work. So, so the big thing is we all work full time. So th this is very much a hobby of ours, but it's a labor of love because there is a lot of work that goes into these. And we started, I don't know, seven years ago with, with one of those old GoPro threes that had no audio and shaky footage. And we start, it, it all started because we wanted to document these trips for us as we still do. It's, it's a great, um, it's great to look back on these trips and, and be able to relive, relive them. And then just like any hobby in, or interest, you, you want to keep progressing and, and, and get better and better because pr progression is part of life. And at every trip, there's always a component of our videos where we're like, Oh, Whoa. if, if we made this a little better then I, we think the quality would be better. And it's sort of been a, a, a progressive, every trip we make, we learn something and that goes into the next film. And a, a big thing was that helped us was getting a drone. Uh, I feel like that brought our, our video editing, our video um, videos up a bit. And for, for, um, for producing, we, we try to make it as authentic as possible. We, we don't go in there with a the storyline. We go in there knowing what, what we're there to do is, is to, just to do this route. We don't, it's, we, authenticity is so important to us. We, we don't want it to be a, to be fake. So it, it's, there's not much, there's not much directing out there or anything like that. It, it's, it, it's all, it's all supposed to be, feel as real as possible. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess like the, there's kind of twofold, right? There's the actual filming of it 
which I think uh, this comment is, is it difficult to keep filming? Sometimes uh, it can be for sure. One thing that I would say is in some circumstances, we'll say like that big portage over the mountain. It was actually easier to film in some circumstances because we wanted to be able to show people how messed up that portage was. So sometimes that's enough fuel for me personally to to do the extra work to film it because I want to make sure that when we get back, we're able to show what what we went through out there. And that that can be a big thing that kind of helps drive us. And, and again, just even for our own memories, I want to remember that portage. I want to be able to, to always look back on that video and remember what we accomplished that day. So like it can actually help in those challenging times, knowing that you will have some footage of it and, and to be able to show uh, people later on. Um, We've got uh, another question here that's about the uh, drone footage. And so, uh, Mad for Maple here, here uh, you guys had some fantastic drone footage throughout. How did you manage to keep a charge for so many shots? So we do carry, uh, Noah and I actually both have uh, the same drone. Um, and it's the DJI Mavic Air. And we we both, how many batteries do you have, Noah? Like five or six? Yeah, four four and i've and i've got six so we've got we brought 10 batteries with us on that trip drone batteries each one can fly for about 15 minutes so something else we often get asked is is would you guys ever use your drone for scouting like could you have used your drone to help you get down that set of rapids or to to find a better line through the forest and the reality is is like many times we're, we're limited obviously on how much uh drone footage we can actually take on this trip and and we we prefer to put it towards actually filming something we want to film rather than uh, just filming to, to try to um, find a line or something like that. And also it, it's such a small screen. It doesn't really give you too much when you're out there to actually be able to, to help you make uh, good decisions, I guess. Like this mountain, for example, some of those drone shots, you actually can't even see some of the, the cliffs that we were trying to avoid um along the side of that mountain so like that that's maybe a good example of of why you wouldn't do something like that and then the the last part is that is we carry a a solar panel and a and a battery bank uh that helps charge batteries along the way so we also have that um got another one here that i can just pull up until i find the new uh, another one but do you ever consider taking a clone on a trip of this scale? Uh, I think it's like a pretty easy answer for us. Yeah, I still have that Coleman. Yeah. Another quick one here. What percentage is type one versus type two fun? I'd say 50 50. Like there's a, I would say like there's a lot of times like around the campfire that we were just dying of laughter, fishing, paddling rapids, all type one fun. But then there's like there's a there's probably a fit like a few hours during the day where you're just not having too much fun, but you know it'll be hilarious looking back at the footage. So I was even gonna be more generous than that. I was gonna say like 70% type one, okay, 30% type yeah. two. And there's yeah. a lot of time during the day out there, and you're just paddling some of those nice lakes, like it's beautiful. Plus, you had a hoot yeah, on that yeah, awesome. portage. Yeah, it's just the portages. It's just the portages that you can you can consider type two fun, I guess. Yeah, and even yeah, some of the right. lining around like Lac Pagu and the first fifty k of the Agonish, <laughs> like some of that lining is pretty gnarly too. But I mean, overall, not that bad. Yeah, bo boys, I'm gonna have to uh, I'm gonna have to go here. I'm on I'm on company time here, but I just want to say thank you everyone for watching. Thank you to Alex and Noah because these guys grind out producing this this you know this series like it's honestly a full-time job for them on top of their full-time job so thank you guys matt it was a pleasure meeting you and traveling with you man it was it was awesome one of the most interesting people who knows the most about outdoorsy stuff i've ever met so thank you so much thanks, everybody thanks for asking your yeah. questions i'm sorry i'm gonna have to hop but uh thanks for, Martin, you're, thanks for, you're, thanks for you're, joining in here brother of course. Yeah. Love you guys. Good to, good to see that sick flow you. back. It's back. Find your north. Find hey, your hey, north. hey, slick slick that hair back and go make some sales. <laughs> <laughs> All right.
Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, do you swear by any resources for meal planning, dehydrated meal recipes? I feel like uh, feeding yourselves must be one of the more dis difficult aspects in planning. Maybe even just talk to what our food plan is usually. Excel spreadsheets. That's the key. Yeah. So, so if you break it down just to like the essence of a dehydrated meal, you want to get as many carbs, as many calories as you can into a, a package, a small package that's not going to go rancid. So you want a dehydrated carb, you want a dehydrated protein, and most, most of the time that dehydrated protein is going to be ground beef. And then you want to add some vegetables to, to get some nutrients and then some, some flavor. So some, some spice, and it's really just coming up with different combinations of that, of, of that trifecta. Um, but at the end of the day, the big, the biggest thing is you, you want to get that, the calories and the nutrients in. Yeah. And then like stuff that preserves well, like you don't, you don't want a lot of fat, like fat will go rancid in a dehydrated meal. So picking things that are calorie dense, but also low fat or have other types of fat, like some of the breakfasts that use that, uh, that powdered coconut milk, that stuff is super calorie dense. And it's an awesome thing to put in like, first thing in the morning with breakfast. But... Yeah. Another one I liked was the uh, powdered peanut butter. Yeah. yeah. So, so that was another question, is, which is what your, what your favorite meal was, was another question. Is it, so, so just going back to the last one, bulk barn is, is your, is your, is your best friend on these trips. Everything in bulk barn is, is already dehydrated or, or in, in a, in a, in a way that like, there's a lot of stuff you can get from bulk barn. I, I think all our stuff was from bulk barn pretty much other than, other than the beef. Yeah. A lot of it. Yeah. I mean, I don't get too crazy with dehydrated meals. I kind of just make a meal that I like that doesn't have a lot of fat that'll go rancid. So I just like make spaghetti and then throw the spaghetti in the dehydrator. And it's, it's about that easy or make curry chicken and throw it in the dehydrator. I don't get, uh, I don't get too complicated with it. We got one here. Do you guys do any hunting? I thought that was good for you, Matt. Yeah, I do a fair bit of hunting. I do uh, some deer hunting in the fall, bear hunting in the fall. Uh, going back out this year again to do another season guiding moose hunts up in northern Ontario. So do a decent amount. I think one of our lunches yeah. on the trip was dehydrated venison jerky. Did you guys bring a gun this time? No, we did not. We didn't really, we didn't really need one on this one. Well, so I have a new appreciation for black bears after our friends, Tristan and Jan, the experience they had up in Labrador th this summer. If you haven't looked, watched this video yet, just uh, just YouTube Bear Attack Labrador, and this and this clip will come up of of our two friends that were on a portage in Labrador this past summer, and they had a very very close black bear encounter. Uh, and after seeing that, I I'm going to be second guessing uh, what what sort of equipment we'll need to to deter bears on future trips. We did bring bear bangers on this one. I do recall. We did. Uh, yeah, but we didn't we didn't use them. See wo wooden or aluminum paddles after using both. Noah probably has some thoughts on that. Well, uh just before we get jump to that, uh on the gun and bear topic, we've we've gotten a few questions now about uh if we got a hold of the owners of the camp. Yeah. So I ended up reaching out to them a couple of weeks when we got back and turned out they were going that, that fall to do their, um, their annual trip. It turns out they, they, they are Americans and they hadn't been able to get up there in the last couple of years because of COVID. And this whole, the whole bear incident was a total surprise to them. And they were, they were very thankful and they, they, they went up and they actually, it, it took them, I forget how long it took them, but it didn't take that long for them to do a full cleanup because a lot of it was more aesthetic and just everything was ripped apart, but like just food everywhere. 
So they, we, we actually, I still talk to them pretty frequently and they actually just sent me a hat from their lodge last week. So Mark, if you're watching this, appreciate that, buddy. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was, that was quite the experience. Um, okay. We've got some here on, uh, managing, uh, I'll just pull them up here. So how much of the trip specifics, like the sleeping locations or the likely portage routes, uh, were you able to plan ahead of time and any anxiety setting out on a trip with that much uncertainty? That's a great question. It's a good one for Matt. Yeah. I mean, as far as like the, the route, the route was pretty well planned. I mean, we could, we could do that on mapping sleeping locations. Not so much. We kind of just depended on where we got to each day and just pick the spot that looked good to camp, but yeah, anxiety. Totally. Absolutely. I think I talked about that. I think it shows up in the series a couple of times. That was pretty, especially I found it took me th about three days to really settle into a groove out there. I would be uh, a little bit antsy around camp at night when we stopped moving for the day. And it took probably three days to kind of get over that and accept like the, the length of time that you're out there for. But yeah, I mean, eventually you kind of settle into a routine. It's just, it, once you get your routine established out there and you realize like you can, you can live and be comfortable and, take care of yourself and everything's okay it kind of helps you cope with uh, cope with some of that at least that's what i found matt a follow-up question to that what was there something you did to tame that anxiety on the trip definitely just establishing a routine like uh, i i know um yeah I, I would be fine during the day for the first couple of days while we were moving and making progress and then it would be stopping at camp and when we we're kind of sitting idle and you have time uh, that's where you might get a little anxious. But once I kind of got into the routine of, of doing the camp chores at night and then maybe going for a swim, cleaning up, brushing your teeth, getting comfortable, like you realize, yeah, you can just live out there and be comfortable and everything's cool. And uh, I mean, that's how that's how I managed it. Um, and you just you just appreciate being out there. Man, you hit on the head with the swim. I, I, I found a yeah. swim was a total reset of the day. Absolutely. Being clean and like having that dedicated set of clean clothes only to be worn after a swim, <laughs> like you get on your clean, comfy clothes. And uh, that, that was pretty nice. It makes you, it makes you feel quite comfortable. Um, so we've got kind of two more paired up questions here. So uh, what do you do for bear protection? So uh, one thing that we had on this trip was bear spray. Um, right, Matt, you had that, right? No, we had bangers. Bear Those bangers. little um, bear, pen okay, flares. We just had bear bangers. I'm mixing it up because of the whole, uh, when the pilot asked us if we had any, I was like, yeah, yeah, don't worry. Like we've got protection, <laughs> but yeah, yeah. We brought bear bangers as well. Uh, and and then this one kind of same line uh did you have any night visitors of any kind none that none that uh okay. none that bothered us got a good one here what was the most memorable moment of the trip oh man i've got i've got a few few that i would say but like the one off the top of my head would, would for me personally would be the float plane ride in and coming to meet you guys that was like i could definitely pick other moments on this tr on the actual trip but for me like noah and i haven't seen each other for years matt you and i hadn't met each other yet like i had a bunch of anxiety this year around the float plane for some odd reason and and just landing there and and meeting up with you guys and all the logistics that it took to get there like I, I don't know if it really truly comes across in the video, but like I was riding an ultimate high when we were standing on that beach and it was just like, I can't believe the four of us are standing on this beach right now. And we are about to hit the egg when Like it was just like yeah. surreal for me. Totally. Se second to that would probably be the uh, beach campsite or, or getting beyond the portage. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man, I can, I can pick so many. Yeah, that that beach campsite. I think it was on uh, Laca du Lutre, right? Uh, yeah, it was before the canyon. That was a that was an amazing night. Just hanging out, playing guitar. That was a that was a beautiful evening. 
Yeah. Um, and yeah, finishing that mountain portage was, I don't think I'll ever forget how I felt at the end of that. For me, I, I would go the opposite way for, for memorable. I would say, so this is one thing we didn't actually capture on film, which, um, which would have been cool too, was the night on the mountain, we got to camp and it absolutely poured rain. And there was there was thunder and lightning and it just absolutely hammered us and it, it was we we're and we didn't know how long it would take to get out and we're just on this the top of this mountain and even though it wasn't it wasn't a, a good memory i look back and it, i would say that moment was the most memorable us just standing underneath this tarp just like all like not knowing all the all the uncertainty was just like <laughs> just peaked when we were just underneath this tarp and I'll, I'll never forget that moment. I just had the memory, like the tarp was sagging down and filling up with rain. And we accidentally dumped about 20 liters of water down the back of Alex's rain jacket when we tried to lift the water off the tarp. Oh, yeah. You know, I was finally dry. <laughs> and you went to go lift it up and it absolutely dumped all over me and right down my back. <laughs> Yeah, uh, that was, I, I uh, definitely thought we were going to get struck by lightning that night. That yeah, it was, that was freaky, actually. And yeah, yeah, to Noah's point, we didn't capture any. I had one clip of you guys when Matt and I had set up camp. You guys were coming down and you had seen the little village that we had set up on top of the mountain. And Eric was super stoked about like the village that we had set up, but didn't really match the the depressing mood that I was going for in the in the video. So I, uh, I couldn't include it, but you guys kind of alluded to the fact that we, we had a quick conversation about how sketched out we all were about the lightning that was on us while we were on top of this mountain surrounded by trees. Yeah. That, that was a great example, though, of no matter how uncomfortable the day gets, at the end of the day, you get all your wet stuff off and you have a warm and dry sleep in your tent. Yeah, and that was the moment I wasn't even sure if that was the thing because we were sleeping in holes. Yeah, I literally set that tent up. I, I was just like pushing trees down into the ground, and the tent went on top of the trees, and it was like the worst campsite ever. But 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 to that point, like we jumped in the tent, and I was like in a hole, and I felt like like my legs were up, and I was like kind of just like sleeping like this. Uh, I slept like a baby for eight hours. It was yeah. amazing. I mean, how could you not work that hard through the day? Yeah. No, we got a good one for you here. What was your favorite geology feature formation that you saw on the trip? Thank you, Josie. I appreciate that. Uh, so, so there's a lot of cool stuff, of course. But one thing that was textbook, like if you're if you're to read any geomorphology book textbook, a picture from this trip would have been in there, and that was the holes created from rocks that that fell in the hole and then got got blended around from water to, to like create a deeper hole. And I don't even know what the, the correct name for that is, but it, it, they're like they're blender holes of, of, with rocks in them. And seeing that and how deep and, and perfectly round these were really puts into perspective how long these rivers have been there and, and how long that rock, that this like little, this little um, tennis ball rock has literally dug a hole into bedrock Pretty cool, guys. Pretty cool. Do you have a question queued up, Alex? Uh, yeah. The, uh, there's a great one. Ride paddle repeat at seven or six thirty-seven. Whenever you get around to it. Oh, that's Darren. What's up, Darren? Talking about camp chores because I think we had a like we had a pretty good system. Um, I mean, maybe I'll, yeah, I'll, I can start. I mean, it was, <clears throat> I mean, I've camped with Noah a lot over the last couple of years. Like we do weekend trips pretty routinely. Um, meeting Alex and Eric was, uh, new, but I mean, we got along pretty seamlessly. And then I don't know, Noah, you kind of, you kind of brought in the, uh, sort of the camp chore division of labor system. Yeah. And, and I, I just brought that on from the last trip and uh and I, we got that from dave and dave got it from from another trip and um yeah and that goes back to the whole idea of a routine and uh knowing sort of what you like what what you need to do when you get to camp it, it takes away from if you know what you got to do it just, it 
things just move smoothly. Um, okay, here's a good one. Is it hard to convince Matt to go on a 30 day trip, even though his previous longest trip was five days? I think it took me all of like 10, like Noah asked me, I don't know, when was that? Back in December of 2020. I think you said, hey, Matt, do you want to go on a 30 day canoe trip this summer? And it was about five seconds before I said yes. So no, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't. That was the fastest response that I've seen. Took, yeah, that was, <laughs> that, was a, two months. that was a pretty easy sell. That, like that was something I always wanted to do. That that was a bucket list trip for me, for sure. Toughest portage of the trip, the Alder Bog or over mountain and around the canyon? Mountain. Mountain. Definitely. No, no contest. The, the Alder Bog, it was bad because we thought we'd get through really quickly. And, and that just added to added to yeah. the moment. That was more psychological. Like, I mean, we floated our gear for a lot of that. And it was just the whole, like, we thought we were just doing a little 700 meter portage to get to an open section of Creek. And then at five o'clock in the evening, we dumped all our gear down there, went around the corner and it choked off again. Like, okay. So that was a little like psychologically crushing, but it was nothing compared to uh, that mountain portage. Uh, Okay, I'm going to do um, a quick one here. So uh, question, are you planning uh, to get a satellite phone? We actually have one. We actually brought two on this trip with us. Um, and they're, they're great. And it's a great resource to keep you safe out there. And also, uh, you can use it for the GPS functionality. Uh, we've got Garmin in reaches. Um, I guess it's probably important to distinguish they're not there. It's not truly like a satellite phone though. Like you can't make a phone call. Yeah. We can't make phone calls. Yeah. Very true. Uh, but Which in, in my experience, it can go either way too, though. Cause sometimes you can't get a hold if they don't answer you're and you're kind of, you kind of have to be stationary. It's nice to just be able to text. And then that message is waiting for somebody. For sure. Uh, we got another one here. Uh, did you catch trout on the fly and what fly was the best? Steve, what's up, buddy? Hey, Steve. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know we what? Did I, catch, we, was... did catch, we did catch yeah, we trout did. on I the think, fly. I feel like the stimulator was the fly of the trip. The stimulator. Yeah, you know what? I, I remember Steve before, a while back, he, uh, he recommended the muddler minnow. And I think we did catch a few on the muddler, but it, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a top fly on this trip. What am I mixing up with a zonker? A zonker, a, a, what do you mean? A, a zonker is like a, uh, is, is a streamer. Okay. Yeah. So I caught a few on that. Um, rock okay. I, I just, I see a comment there from Mo rock kettles. At that time? sounds uh, he, he was he was just responding to that that geological feature of the uh, the hole blended by the rocks, and it, rock kettles sounds sounds like that might be it. Any for anyone that was interested. Um. Okay. And sorry, I had a couple lined up here. So. so we also had a lot of here. questions about bugs too. If there's any that you can find there. About sorry. There's a lot of questions bugs. about the bugs on this trip. I, I've got them all queued up here. I'm just trying to do some organization here. So uh did you guys uh take canoe lessons or training or did you learn by yourself? So uh I think a bit of a mix for all of us, but uh I had done some training with like a local paddling group called the Paddler Co-op here in Ontario, uh, in Palmer Rapids. And, uh, that was really where I got my start. And, um, and then other than that, just practicing what we had learned there. Um, Noah, I think you had done some out in Nova Scotia as well as with the co-op. Yeah. So, so the lessons I've, I've, I've learned for canoeing it, I've learned the most things by just falling out of the boat, to be honest. I, I've, 
leading up to the Labrador trip in 2019, I, I really tried to push myself um, and, and tried to learn as much as I could. And I ended up swimming a lot of times. And every time you swim, you, you learn what you did wrong. And you, when you're in a safe environment and you're not going to hurt yourself or others, it's it's good to see what you can can't do like you need to push those boundaries in a safe split in a safe environment i, I can't stress that enough but falling into your boat that's it, it's not the end of the world it's 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 the best way to learn and um i, I would say that's where i got most of my mo, most of my uh my skills were, were from failure and then i just learned from going with noah so Uh, this I felt like kind of paired up with that. So why did you stay in the starting boat pairs and why didn't you collaborate on food? Uh, so I think the starting boat pairs is just experience. So Noah and Matt being out in Nova Scotia together, they had the most experience paddling whitewater together. So keeping those and then Eric and I having done uh, the Catawagamy trip last year uh, together that uh, or two years ago, I guess that was now. Um that's why we kept the canoe partners the same just for the whitewater stretches. And then why didn't we collaborate on food? So there was a bit of like mit risk mitigation, I think, with this, with just um, not knowing for sure that we were going to be able to fly in and meet up with Noah and Matt. It was the risks of um, what if what if that connection didn't happen? What if our plane was delayed by four days because we had terrible weather and we we had to basically change where we flew into and what if noah and matt were waiting for food based on our arrival so we wanted to basically plan two fully self-sufficient boats and and that's just the way that it worked logistically for this uh this particular trip would you guys have anything to add to that i think it helps a little bit in terms of keeping the the boat partners the same too on portages like you know all the gear that's contained within your boat and you get like the loads were the same. Like it was, you know, this barrel and this bag and then that barrel and that bag and the boat and this bag. And you just, you don't forget anything because it's always the same. Nothing gets yeah. uh, like left behind at the start of a portage. Um, another one here uh, is, did you wish you had the spray decks on the canoes? I remember at least once a canoe riding very low in the water. Uh, fantastic series. Thank you. Um, so I think this was just like, a, I think we're still trying to get used to the whole spray deck thing. They're relatively new to our, our kits. We've used them now on, on two bigger trips, but sometimes for myself personally, I find it challenging to, it, when you're in and out of the boat a lot and, and there's a lot of portages, they're not the best to portage with. So you have to take them off and they're not quick to take on and off. Um, and, and then when you're jumping in and out of the boat all the time, like th there's a little bit of like preparation to actually like pull the skirt up around you and tie yourself in. And, and so I think we're still just trying to find like a good rhythm. Cause we ended up carrying the spray decks with us most of the time. And we probably could have used them in a couple scenarios. Um, but it's almost, uh, yeah, I don't know. I guess a few times we ran some sets where it was just like maybe, maybe it's maybe we should have, but we just decided not to. Um, another quick one here before, and then I'll jump to some bug ones here. Is uh, can you go back to provincial parks after this? And I would, I would definitely say yes. Like it, it's there's a lot of beautiful places out there, and this was just checking another area off the list, and so lots of. Lots more places out there to explore, and we have nothing against provincial parks. There's a lot of really great, uh, a lot of great places to uh, paddle out there. Um, so we got one here. How do you stay so calm when the bugs are attacking? I also saw another great one that was like, uh, I hope you guys are letting some mosquitoes <laughs> into your houses for true authentic uh, authenticity. So that was funny. I don't know where it is, but. I guess I have a question for Steve. Who is calm? <laughs> I feel like we're all like freaking out when the with all the bugs. It's it, the bug nets. It's the bug nets are absolutely game changers. I wouldn't do a trip like this without a bug net. I I can tell you that right now. I don't understand how, how the the earlier travelers 
and indigenous trap like lived out there without these without bug nets because they are ferocious they're relentless they, they don't care they don't care who you are or, or what you do or anything like that they just <laughs> they, they really are just absolutely the worst and screened tents too that's that's the part that gets me more than the bug nets is how do you do how how anyone could have done something like that without a screen tent it's uh it's it's mind-blowing yeah and, so much and, so much respect for for people who did those kinds of trips before all this technology that we have now yeah that that's a huge one eh yeah yeah there's lots of questions on the bugs here uh someone else was asking if um repellent works I, I would say it, it does have an effect for sure. Sometimes they're just so bad though; they're going to get you somewhere. But it it definitely helps out in some places. Yeah, yeah. Until you uh, sweat it off. Until you sweat it off, and I, I know people are going to grill me for this because you're not supposed to put uh, bug repellent on your skin. But I like to put a little bit on my temples. I, I find that's where I get smoked the most by bugs, and just putting a little bit of spritz of Chanel right there, uh, it, it does it does do it does help out a lot. Um, so Matt, did you just bust a beer out of your cooler? Yeah. <laughs> I heard the um, zip. I love it. I brought, I didn't want to get up in the middle, so I brought a cooler with some no, ice packs. I, I respect that. Respect that, everyone. Matt it, it was, came well prepared the, with a cooler to the side. Oh, I'm onto the Tuscat Falls Brown Porter now. Brown Porter. A, a beautiful, uh, another beautiful Nova Scotia river. Um, we've got one here. I usually use worms for brook trout, but it uh, looks like you were using lures. Do you have a favorite lure specifically for brookies? Whatever they're biting. I, I, would, I would add to that and say we're usually throwing little Cleos, little Cleo spoons, different sizes. What what I like about them is how heavy they are. And and yeah, pretty much they'll, they'll bite a lot of different things, but it's it's – it's more for me, like how how you can get your lure to them, and 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 with a little Cleo, you can launch it a lot farther than a than a Meps or something small like that. Jordan's definitely not wrong though. The old uh, the old spinner in a worm hatch is definitely a thing. Yeah, I wonder if he's from Nova Scotia. I feel like that's big here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you guys seem to spend time cutting wood into nice, pretty pieces. Why do you do that? Why not just burn longer pieces? and half and then half again rather than spending the extra energy cutting them i feel like we need a, we need some sort of pile going in order yeah. to uh to get the the fire up and and when we're putting pots on top and stuff you need you need some things to move around a little bit and when you when we it's not like all four of us need to cut wood every single night uh unless you just crossed a mountain in which case we all took healthy turns cutting wood but uh the a uh, big thing was uh, just, ha I think having a pile definitely helps. We've got one here. How how do you all swing the time off work uh, to do these trips? Uh, do you burn an entire year's worth of vacation? So I, I definitely have burned a year's worth of vacation before when I did the Labrador trip and I uh, took whatever that was, was, five weeks off for that one. Um, but last year, that was part of the reason why I could only join for half of the trip is my vacation just didn't uh, pan out for last year. Last year, So it was uh, just the two weeks. I don't know if you guys want to add anything yeah. to that. I mean, we're pretty fortunate to work for a company that's fairly invested in work-life balance i would say and 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 everyone that i worked with was pretty enthusiastic about supporting me so it was just a combination of making it work on my end between uh you know a lot of some carried over vacation i, I mean with covid travel restrictions and stuff i hadn't used all my previous year's vacation and then i you know taken some time off unpaid from work to make it happen i don't know that's pretty much your situation noah yeah uh ditto Okay. Uh, if you had to choose between one, what would it be? Blazing a new portage trail up a mountain or large water crossing in questionable weather? I, I'd choose the mountain, I think. I think I'd be on the mountain too. 100%. Water water crossing, there's water certainty crossing, with 
There, there's certainty yeah. that you, you know what you're getting into when you're blazing a new portage trail. A large uh, water crossing, you have you have no idea. Yeah. And if you tip out crazy. there, if you tip, and yeah. it, depending on weather <laughs> conditions too, water being cold, you could really be be in. And, and assuming, excuse me, whatever weather actually makes you tip, it's going to be hard to write yourself again, especially if you're out in the middle. Well, that's the thing. It doesn't look. I mean, it might be hard to tell watching, but I mean, you dump in a rapid, you just get spat out at the bottom for the most part. If you dump in the middle of a three kilometer open stretch of turbulent water on a lake, like there's not a lot you can really do to get back at that point. Yeah. Dave's got a good one in here. Mine did. I got I got brought on board with the moss routine. I was, a, was, I, was a deni- I was a I was a moss denier on day one, and I, I definitely came around. I I love a good moss wipe. I actually prefer it. Sometimes uh, when when I'm in the city, I just I, I keep a pot <laughs> a pot of <laughs> moss. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um. Okay. A couple quick ones here. Uh, tips for new videographers, probably my biggest one is, is just start, go out and start doing it. And the sooner you start filming and the sooner you start putting out videos, the faster you learn. Um, and then I think also maybe watching other people, there's lots of, uh, information out there now. And I think there's, there's lots that can get you going pretty quick. Um, yeah. just to add to that, I know sometimes I get, I get caught up, I, I get overwhelmed by YouTubing specifics and specs about about different cameras and frame rates and color grading and to be honest it, it's it's deterred me more than it, it's actually um motivated me to, to to film and i think the biggest thing is what alex just said is just film and at the end if you don't, if you don't like it figure out what you don't like about about your product and then fix that rather than trying to take in all this information that means nothing to you until you know what it means by by your final product yeah um got a good one here uh did you guys feel ready to go back to work after the trip or did you need time to cover oh shoot i guess we already kind of answered this one and i don't think i checked that one off uh but just in general going back to work sometimes it can definitely feel like you need a vacation after your vacation but you fall back into the swing of things pretty quickly yeah i i and this kind of adds to uh, another question I saw earlier on, um, like mentally, how long does it take to recoup from these trips? And, and I, I find, so so this trip, I, I've been thinking about for two years. And before the trip, it was about planning it and coming and and figuring out the logistics and and the and what we needed to do. And then when you're out there, you want to like the goal is to finish it. And then once you're done, there, there's 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 a there's a void of, of time when you, when you kind of feel you kind of don't really have any direction, and it, it's about a week where where I, I feel really really uh, really off and like directionless before then before getting back into the the rhythm of of normal life back back here in um, in Halifax. Yeah, this is a good question. I mean, for, for me, it was, uh, there was two sides to this one transitioning back. Like I was very excited to see family and friends and stuff. That was very, I found that very easy. Like I was really, you know, obviously get back to my fiance. I was very excited about that. Uh, I found it was the getting back to technology and notifications, it was like notifications on your phone and email and social media and stuff. That was, I, I found the, uh, the information overload a little bit overwhelming, but, um, I mean, I was I was very grateful to be back around, uh, you know, friends and family and stuff again. I was very excited to see them. Um, <clears throat> kind of along the same lines. What's the first thing you wanted when you got home? Hmm. Craft beer. There, there were a couple songs that I, I was really, really looking forward to playing and listening to. Like what? Uh, I, for some reason, I, I was, 
I listened to the I listened to a lot of the War on Drugs. I, I don't know what it was, but on that trip, I, a couple of those songs kept playing through my mind, and that was pretty nice to listen to some some music. Though Alex, you are pretty you are quite the musician yourself, which added a lot of that. Lot yeah, of, we had yeah. a few of us out there, Matt. You you surprised me as well. I didn't realize you played so much guitar. <laughs> Yeah, I was enjoying the uh, the Johnny Cash. That was great. Eric's really good too. I love listening he's to him play. Oh, he's a fantastic guitar player. Yeah. Okay, we got to go. Things oh, yeah, right. things to come easier. I think just in general, like after a while, sometimes you want stuff that's a little easier. You know, like oh, I'm hungry. Okay, well out there, that means I've got to cut wood and make a fire and boil water and cook supper. Like you can't just you know go grab a bite quick. I, I think after a month. That's probably something you start to, to long for a little bit. We got a good one here. Were risky roulets as good as you made them seem? And neither of you up, say anything. Yes, they were. <laughs> follow up question really? to that. Yeah, those brulees had to be the best part of the whole <laughs> thing. Matt is a champ. <laughs> First big trip, guy mixes up some cocktails. How much whiskey did you bring? And how much would you bring next time? <laughs> <laughs> Your question is, Matt, if you had no restrictions, how much Mio would you have poured in those things? <laughs> yeah, Noah was cutting me off on the Mio. I just wasn't prepared. I wasn't prepared for the amount of Mio you put in there. I blew his mind a little bit. He panicked. He thought I was going <laughs> to use it all. Save a couple of squirts for the mountain. <laughs> uh, yeah, those were those were tasty, I thought. Uh, they, were, they were awesome. Okay, I can hear Katie laughing at me in the next room right now. Uh, we've got one here. How much toilet paper does one plan for over three weeks? None if you're using moss. I think I brought a roll. Yes, yeah, so I think we all brought a roll. Yeah, I think each of us probably brought a roll. It, it's Rashing. so, so I, I guess I, I got to complain here. So, moss is good for 90 the 95 percent, but the final five percent, you, you, it's good to get like a, a, a one like a security what a security wipe with. With something that's consistent. <laughs> I wasn't so, prepared for the security wipe. <laughs> yeah, I, I was. I was doing security wipe right at the end. Do you want to explain what that is? I, I feel like there's a lot of people just itching to know what a security wipe is. Well, it's it's similar to a courtesy flush. <laughs> it, it just it, you just want to finish up clean and, and you know it's a guaranteed with with one, one with one nice wave so i think he's saying use moss for the first little bit for most of the damage and then finish the job with a nice <laughs> thing of toilet paper um okay we got one here on the editing so do we hire an editor or do we do most of the editing so Noah and I actually split it on this one Noah did the first two weeks and I did the second but Noah and I do do all of the editing for uh the videos that we put out we have not hired anyone to help and you do an excellent job of it thanks it's not, it, it definitely is nice to get those comments at the end. I've seen quite a few really nice comments in here just about how much uh, everyone has enjoyed the series. And that definitely means a lot to us because like Noah brought up earlier, this is not our full-time jobs. And, uh, but it, especially for a series like this ends up being a full-time job outside of our full-time jobs and, and can be pretty draining by the end of it. Uh, so it's, it's definitely nice yeah. to hear those things for sure. I mean, what I'll say, because people might not, like, this is a perspective a lot of people might not have, but as somebody who went on the trip and then watches the video, you guys do an amazing job of, like, capturing the feeling in certain moments. Like, a night at camp, and you get the right music and the right shots, and you, like, capture the way that we felt at that time. And, like, as a person who was on the trip and then watched the series, like, it's very accurate. The way, those, the, the way you feel watching it is how we felt when we were on the trip, which is pretty incredible. That's awesome. Um, kind of along the same lines of just the filming, is drone flying completely legal in Canadian wilderness? I know it's illegal in U.S. wilderness areas. I actually hadn't heard that it was illegal in certain areas of the U.S., but I'm not as familiar with their rules. But for us, as long as you're outside of a provincial park and, and then you just need to know if there's any, um, like, airports or... 
I'm forgetting what the term is, but like aero zones or something like that. But um, when we're in the places that we're traveling, it's it's no risk most of the time. Uh, there's another one here. Uh, are there any countries you would like to do a trip in? I don't think we discriminate against any other countries, but there's just so much to explore in our home country here that we haven't ventured outside yet. Uh, here's a good one here. Humor. It's got to be humor. How did each of you manage tough times, group management, people skills with each other that you appreciate? I, I would I would definitely add, I would agree with Matt. Humor. And the other thing is why I think we, we, we click so much out there is none of us really have an ego. And because of that, it, it's really easy to, to, to solve problems out there when we're, you're all on the same page and, and, and all the same goal in mind. Yeah, definitely. I found like, in, I mean, we're looking at uh, like looking at a set of rapids and stuff and we might have two different ideas, but one's just as good as the other and everyone recognizes that. So nobody gets too hung up on like, oh, I want to do it my way. It's just as long as there's a way, we all have the same goal. And I feel like we never really had that situation where, yeah, because every, everyone's, no one really had an ego about uh, decisions like that. But um, making each other laugh is a pretty, uh, a pretty great way to deal with uh, deal with the tough days. I think some of the harder days, we definitely all laughed a lot at camp. Yeah, I, I would say Eric is one of the funniest guys I know. I, I, I probably yeah. cried laughed <laughs> several times on that trip. But yeah, I think that showed in the series too. A lot of people were chiming in on uh, on old Rick there. Yeah. Um, we got one here. How much the guitar slash music boosts your morale in the woods? I'd say it's definitely a valuable thing to bring. And yeah, with it with it being wood, it 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 uh, it can always be used for a campfire if 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 it breaks. Yeah, huge. Yeah, some of, some of those nights playing music around the fire were like some of my favorite memories from that trip. Yeah. Uh, no, there's someone that just wants to apologize for chasing you down at the Timmy's the other day. Oh, <laughs> yeah, uh, was that Ryan? Ryan. Ryan, what's up, buddy? Uh, yeah, he he caught me off guard yesterday when I was uh, after ordering uh, <laughs> ordering our coffee and going to pick up some mail. But awesome guy, I'm glad I met you. And uh, Chad, your buddy Chad, or the other guy that you're working with. Um do some rapid fire ones here so who did most of the dishes uh we kind of alternated on this i'd say you mean like making the meals or like doing dishes at night oh that's a good question i took it as doing the dishes but i i guess when you read it like that it's kind of like maybe who who made the dishes i feel like it's the same answer either way i think we split it all yeah yeah, yeah. Like with these trips, we we try to keep it as as even as possible with with everything. Um. Okay. Here's another good one. Were you hoping for more wildlife? I I, I can I can answer that quickly. For for me, uh, I try not to go in with with any expectations, really. And anything we see is is awesome. I I, I would I would say no to that. Yeah, I mean, I, I wildlife is a huge part of going out into these places for me. I, I love seeing seeing wildlife, and but I was really happy with what we saw. I mean, we saw that huge bull moose on the second day. I think day four or five, we saw a caribou. Like I don't know, I was I was thrilled with uh, with the wildlife we did see. um all right uh we got one here on dealing with mental fatigue 
uh, mental fatigue. Humor again, I think. It's another and, humor one. T- teamwork, yeah. like you're 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 not just alone out there. You're you're part of a team, and everyone. I feel like everyone, like when one person's down, somebody else is picking them up, kind of. You know. It's definitely it. I'd agree with that 100. percent It's a uh, team and humor. I think everybody has their low moments, but it's kind of part of the teamwork. Is you know, when one guy's down, everybody else sort of picks him back up. For sure. Exactly. Got one here from Allison. Uh, I think she she might mean Eric and I uh, noticed no sweet with meat on this trip. Uh, I, I, I want to say that I definitely ha- had that at some point, but maybe maybe I didn't film it with uh, quite the same excitement that I did on the Float of James Bay series. So thank you for that. We definitely did a peanut butter summer sausage combo one day. <laughs> yeah. They're all good. Sweet and salty. I uh, got another one here. What role did the RCGS play in this trip? So on this trip, they... they um... So we applied to the, uh, so the RCGS has an expedition grant that they do each year. And we applied to the, to the expedition grant and, and they gave us some money for this trip. Yeah. In return, we, we do trip report for them and provide them with content, like the photos and videos that you see. Um, we, we provide them with content on areas that just have very little information available on them uh we got some around just so i guess we got one here on what got you into canoe tripping maybe we can do a quick around like from for myself when i was young uh my my mom uh took me car camping quite a bit um and the uh, and I guess my first canoe trip was with Noah and his mom who had done a few other canoe trips and someone also asked where our first canoe trip was. And for me, it was McRae Lake in Ontario, which is now a very populated, I would almost call it a club, but, yeah. uh, no, I don't know if you want to like chase that one. Yeah. It's, it's same thing. Our, our moms got us into, into canoe tripping and, that that definitely definitely was a huge influence on us. And McCray was your first as well, right? McCray, yeah. Uh, I would say we, we we probably shouldn't name drop, but McCray has turned into an absolute party zone now. So anyone looking to go to McCray Lake for a, a peaceful weekend, it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, and Matt, what was your first canoe trip? I think my first canoe trip, I was I like I used to be an army cadets and we did a five day canoe trip on the St. John River in New Brunswick when I was probably 14 or 15. I would say that was my first big one. But yeah, I mean, I've always just kind of been been into the outdoors and it was just a progression. Um, but that was my first. Uh, we got one here. Ballpark net cost of the trip. So trips like this transportation and food are probably the bulk of the costs gear i guess gear if you if you're missing a piece of gear that can add up quickly but many times we actually have quite a bit already that we've built but i find every single trip that i take i have to buy some some new piece of gear so uh, yeah gear and then transportation like the if you're taking a float plane in those are pretty expensive yeah, I mean, realistically, you spend a bit more on food than you would if you were just living at home for a month because, like, some of the stuff is more expensive and you, you're eating more. But I wouldn't, yeah. When you consider that you'd still be buying food to live at home, food's not really a massive cost at the end of the day. Yeah. Yep. So, kind of hard to say. Depends on the trip, length of yeah. the trip as well. But for me and Noah, it wasn't that bad because we drove. The whole way the train tickets weren't very expensive i mean you guys had the float plane flight that was a, mm-hmm. a bit but what would you say like a couple thousand bucks oh i mean we could look it up but oh not even no i mean if you're not counting gear because i mean you use the gear on other trips 
few hundred dollars each in food and a few hundred dollars each in transportation maybe but that's the thing like you eat in normal life as well yeah. so it, it's really it's boil it right down if, if you do this stuff anyways on we if you do weekend trips doing a doing a month-long trip is the only extra expense is getting getting there yeah which which for us doing a trip in Cote nord being able to drive to set deal and then hop on the two and rail line which is not that expensive of a of a ticket like very accessible trip to do yeah i uh, got another one good one here uh do you do any specific training ahead of the trip uh alex riding around town on a unicycle portaging i wouldn't necessarily say that that was part of my my training going into this but uh some of the training uh we've we've got first aid wilderness well or i guess wilderness first aid training uh, which is great to have out there because I think a lot of the injuries that actually happen aren't don't end up being trip ending, uh, and you want to be able to deal with kind of the minor things while you're out there, uh, where you might not need to call in like a plane or a helicopter to actually get you out, but just dealing with things yourself. Um, and then whitewater training as well, whitewater rescue training. Uh, so both how to paddle whitewater training and then uh whitewater rescue so actually rescuing in whitewater are all uh things that we have and would recommend as well what are the star skies at night slash stars like i personally wouldn't know <laughs> yeah, that's what I, I, don't that's think I wanted to save that one because I knew I knew we were just gonna say yeah we we usually just crash so early but yeah Noah's never made it past nine p.m. so he can't tell you <laughs> yeah but beautiful you get away from the city lights and the uh, I mean you you don't have to go to Cote Nord mm -hmm. Quebec you just get get a couple hours away from a major city and you can see some pretty incredible stars. So, um, Alex, there are a lot of questions coming through, so maybe just start like banging them off here. Like, just like click one, you know, and it'll be like a surprise. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, isn't that what I've been doing this entire time? I, I feel like I've been pretty good at like popping them up here. No, no, you've been great. And, and like I said, feel free to jump in and tell me what the name and the time is, and I'd be happy to pop them up for you. There, there's so many great questions coming in. It's it's. I'm trying to catch up because there's there's literally so many questions and and thank you so much everyone for uh, for for asking all these questions they're all great. I found a French one here. We can hit a French one. I think I can do this. Uh, okay, first let's just tackle this one. Noah, do you want to take this one while I just like keep uh, diving through yeah. here? What has been your most memorable trip? Which province have you enjoyed the most? so that is that's a really tough question and i know this this is almost like a cop out but every trip is memorable i i think for for me the labrador trip that we did in 2019 boreal to bearlands is the most memorable because it was my first large trip and i just didn't know I, there, there was so much i didn't know of, of what we're going to get into and um i think i just meant it was it was like the the, the biggest mental shift for me on these trips and i realized after that I, that this is something i want to keep doing yeah though if anyone's traveling to labrador the labrador climate is pretty damp and because of that you're going to have more bugs and mosquitoes in labrador compared to let's say you, you went to the northwest territories in, in a little drier drier climate so anyone looking to get out there, make sure you got your bug net. Uh... <laughs> no, I think this one's for you. <laughs> <laughs> I don't, you can't script that though, right? That's got to be improvised. Yeah, the, the, that's, that's a, uh, I can't be It's all off the cuff. It's yeah. all off the cuff. What you see is uh, what you get, folks. We have another one here. You guys should sew an extra button to cover your <laughs> belly button. Matt told me to have a picture of my belly button fired up because there's so many people that were just like, I do not want to see your belly button. Please put that thing away. 
That was probably the thing you took the most flack for in this whole series was that belly button shot. (laughs) Also, in one of the final edits, when I sent uh, it to Noah for review before Noah gave me a round of edits before it goes live, uh, I had an extended period of like the morning after that shot, which was in the next video. And uh, one of Noah's comments was, hey, man, maybe you should reduce how much you show your belly button because it seems to have... (laughs) It seems to have uh, scared off some of our fans. <laughs> so that's so funny. Uh, we got one here on uh, how Noah and I met. Noah and I actually went to elementary school and high school together. We've known each other for a very long time. Um. Eric's face was a mess from the bug bites. Were you worried that he was having an allergic reaction? Definitely. It was definitely something we were keeping an eye on, but there was not maybe much that we could. Uh... He did take a Benadryl. He did. Yeah. Like, to take that swelling down. Cause I was, I think his left eye was not working so well. <laughs> yeah. It was, it was pretty destroyed. Uh, do you guys bring any reading material on the trip? Matt, I think he, I saw you had a book. Yeah, we both brought books. Actually, we should. I wish we'd brought two because I finished mine like week two and a half. So, I read uh, Alaska's Wolfman, the story about Frank Glazer. So, if anyone's into uh, like wilderness, uh, wilderness living books, that's a great one. Highly recommend it. And I read Miracle in the Andes, which my girlfriend recommended before the trip. Um. Okay, wow, there's so many good questions coming in here. Uh, quick and easy one here. How old are you guys? So I'm turning 31 this year. I'll be 31. turning 31 soon. 1991. 91. Uh, how do you find the longevity of the Eskif, uh T4MX, especially on whitewater and over rocks? I we so the, the, the one canoe that we've used on this trip, it's we've beaten it up for two and a half years, and I we are not light on gear, and it still ha- still floats and still no leaks. So I would say exceptionally well. Um, what was the biggest lake you crossed on this trip? From my wife, who has a huge crush on Noah. <laughs> I think the biggest crossing was that one where we got windbound in on Tikanak. Yeah. As far as, as far as just an open, like open crossing. Yeah. Th- there's about seven kilometers there where we felt pretty exposed. Uh, my wife wants to know if you're still making the cocktail with the gummies, the whiskey brulee. Do you guys I still make it? it I don't think it has the same effect at home. I think that's a, I'm not saying it won't happen again, but I think that's a uh, that's only for the woods. I, I Matt, I think we need to have one at your wedding this August. Yeah, it's gonna. That's true. That my my wedding bar will be just whiskey sours, whiskey brulees, Matt. <laughs> or whiskey brulees, whiskey brulees. Yeah, everyone's gonna be hyped up on on all the. Uh... Oh, I wanted to say antioxidants. What am I trying to say? <laughs> Inside of the uh, electrolytes. electrolytes, all the electrolytes. Yeah. Everyone will be Very buzzing. Easy. Yeah, well hydrated. <laughs> um, so a couple on, on footage here. So great videos. Wondering on these trips, do you guys ever cross paths with other YouTubers or other outdoorsy groups? We haven't crossed paths with anyone on like any of these big trips that we're passing, but we have uh, uh, Jim and Ted Barrett had actually done part of the uh, Labrador trip that we had done, right? Yeah, they did a river south of us, but that that upper stretch, we would have done similar ground. Yeah, so we did cross a little bit of similar similar territory there, and then I guess on the floated James Bay series, uh, same thing. I can't remember what river Jim had done up there, but it was a similar kind of circumstance. Kesagami, yes. Uh, how many hours of footage did you get from this trip? Who does your editing? So we kind of answered this already, but so many hours of footage, it's ridiculous. It's uh, a lot to 
to go through it all. Um, <laughs> do you think your partners would ever do a big trip with you? I would say so. I don't know. Katie's listening in the next room right now. So <laughs> I don't think she's going to do a 30 day one, but we do lots of weekend trips together. She's uh, she's definitely down to come on uh, on weekend commute trips with me. Oh my gosh. I keep scrolling down in the, in the, the comments just keep going. Uh, okay. Yes, we did find out. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so did you find out why people were honking their horns at you at the end of the trip? Did they know who you were? Yes. So apparently, so there are float planes in the area and there, there was a float plane that flew over top of us and saw two canoes on this river. And when he came back, I, I think uh, word got around that there's, there's two canoes going down the Agu niche and they were sort of expecting us to, sh to show up eventually. So there, there was a little bit of anticipation there, I think. And then I'd imagine, I mean, it's not a big community. So the, the pilot that uh, flew Alex and Eric in, like it was word probably had gotten around too about you guys getting dropped off and, uh, and, and making your way down the river. Yeah. So yeah, there was uh, yeah, very nice, very nice people. We had a very warm reception. They're giving smoked salmon. Would you guys ever do another canoe trip in Labrador? Definitely. Yeah, Labrador is huge. There, there's so many opportunities to do th cool things up there and never do the same river. So this is a great question and something we we flipped around. Do you prefer the semi-dry suits or would you go full dry suit? Also, did you find the suit held up the bushwhacking? So I, I think so I think the, the thing with a full dry dry suit is it keeps you fully dry, but it, it's sort of restricting uh, in the other aspects of these trips. And again, that we might have all the different opinions on this, but for me, I, I, I would feel uncomfortable getting to camp and, st and setting up a fire with my full dry suit on. And I don't, I couldn't see myself taking my dry suit off before I start doing camp chores, just knowing me. So I feel like there would be risk of, um, burns, sweating profusely and other uncomfortable things wearing a full suit. Yeah, I, th I think it would just be trip dependent. If you were doing a ton of big, bulky white water, like a full dry suit would probably be pretty nice. But for this trip, I think the pants were good enough. Okay, a couple quick ones here. So uh, is that the same canoe that bent in half? I'm assuming they're thinking of maybe the Labrador series, which that wouldn't have been the same but you also had folded yours. Yeah, so I bent that canoe with Matt this the, the, the April before that in Nova Scotia. Uh, what do you journal when on these trips? It, or do you journal, I guess, if you if so, what do you use it for? I, I kept a journal personally, and mainly for me, it's just to kind of remember what happened during the day. It helps me with editing and also just something great to look back on. Do you guys have anything to add to that? or? Yeah, I mean, I, I kept a journal. It, mine was pretty basic. A lot of just weather, what we did that day, distance coverage, just stuff that helps like jog the memory when you read back and think about it. Some, you know, whatever maybe I was thinking about that day. Um, all right. Uh, do you bring backup fuel to cook or always plan on starting a fire? We, we do have emergency fuel with us that we try to limit for, for, um, really, really wet days or, or days we're not really feeling like, um, so we, we want to have a fire, which wasn't often actually. I think in the first, it was just twice we used the stove in the first two weeks. Once because it was just too dry to have a fire and once because it was pouring rain and we used it under the tarp. But 
finishing that mountain portage, Alex, you got your stove out. And that was actually, uh, like that, that was kind of one of those situations where like, Hey, like we need some, something warm in us right now. Cause this is getting really cold. Like having that stove was pretty, pretty key after we finished that mountain portage. Definitely. Okay. We got some good ones coming up here. Uh, we got Philly chili wanting to know when Noah's cash me on the outside portage album is going to drop. Uh, Followed by Katie coming in with "Shoddy is a window shopper." <laughs> <laughs> so stay tuned for the album drop. It's coming later. Uh, we got one here on uh, what do you use for editing? Uh, we've been using Lightworks, but not sure if we want to stick with it. Uh, we've been using uh, Adobe Premiere Pro, uh, but. Uh, we've also heard really good things about uh, what was the one Chris Prouse was telling us about. Uh, app, no, uh, it's the Mac one. I don't know. I'm forgetting the Mac one, but it, it doesn't require a subscription fee versus Adobe Premiere Pro. Uh, got one here. Why Northern Scavenger? So uh, way back in. December of 2015, I was, I was sitting on all these photos and videos that we had and trying to find a name where we could get the Instagram handle, the the website and everything all the same. And Northern Scavenger was what came to mind and and what has been. But we've been getting a lot of qu comments on this lately about the name Northern Scavenger. Maybe we should do a poll sometime. But of what people's true thoughts are on it. You boys will be happy to know I chased my first blue line last weekend. Life changing. Yes. I think I was actually, just, I was chatting with Evan last week about that too. That's awesome, man. That's very Congrats. cool. Uh, so some quick ones here. So how many nights did you sleep on a beach? I'll leave this one for you guys. Cause you guys spent a lot of the nights on there. Oh, as of the first two weeks, cause I only know it cause it's in the series. I think it was 11 of 17 of the first 17 nights. I can't, I don't know what it was for the second half. 11, probably a couple. Quite I'll, a few. Almost, I'll almost we still had quite a few beach nights. Yeah. Yeah. I would say almost 50% of our, of, of our, of our, of our sites were beach sites for the, for the full four weeks. Um, got another one here. How do you stay somewhat clean while you're out for so long? Swims are, are great. You need to find your time to get out and get in for swims. Sometimes, sometimes it's painful. Sometimes you're cold, but you'd be amazed at, at how refreshed you can feel after jumping into some water. Yeah. We brought some soap, like body wash. So Matt, I still remember you and I jumped in the water after when yes. we arrived, when we arrived at the mountain portage and you and I had been blazing trail all night you yeah. and I had talked on the mountain. We're definitely swimming when we get down and it was cold. It was pretty cold when we went down. Yeah. That night. It was but dark. We, and I think it was like drizzling and cold, but there's like, there's no way I'm getting in my sleeping bag having not swam tonight. So yeah, I felt, and it felt good. Yeah, absolutely. Um, another good one. Do you do any physical conditioning or training in, in trip prep? I, I think we're all pretty active people that are, that are regularly working out and, and doing our thing. Um, how much did your canoes weigh? I think they're they're seventy five. Uh, I would say fully kitted, they're about eighty pounds. Eighty pounds. Yeah. They're they're heavier canoes, but like for the durability that we get when we're out there for a month, knowing and just the reliability of knowing that you can you can do whatever you want to them, uh, it, it's it's definitely worth the wait. And and then and then you come back looking chiseled like Matt. So, uh, good question for Matt. There, what did Katie like your chiseled body? After yeah, you totally. She loved it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. At what age uh, would you say a person should stop wanting to do what you guys are doing? I'm hoping not to find that age personally. Never. Yeah. I mean, easy for me to say now, but I yeah, hope never. I would hope never for my own sake. So, so to, to add to that, I, I have. I have more recently been thinking about the longevity of, of my body after these trips, because after you do feel like your bodies get pretty destroyed and 
having poor posture on portages when you're when you're in uncomfortable situations stepping over over logs and stuff as of recently and i've in the last few months i've started to do more yoga and stretching and ways just to extend my body my, my body's um like physical physical abilities because the i think the only thing that would stop us is is injuries and the older we get the, the more we're gonna have to think about how, how are we gonna preserve our bodies really yeah i mean that that really goes into the pre-trip training too like going into these trips in good shape not so, just just so you don't hurt yourself um like realistically one of the most likely injuries on a trip like this is going to be a like a pulled muscle in your back or something trying to get a canoe up re realistically uh okay sorry uh, i wasn't expecting that you guys to answer it that fast uh here you go matt I've only experienced, can Matt talk about taking on such a large trip for the first time? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, there's so many, so many facets to that. Like, in, but realistically, like what I found, obviously picking a route and understanding what you're getting yourself into is hugely important. But um, the challenge is like individually, if you just like look at like a set of rapids, and I think Noah said this to me, he said like, man, set of rapids in Labrador is the same thing as a set of rapids in Nova Scotia. We're going to tackle it the same way. And it's, it's very true. So if you like break, break those challenges down individually and you can prepare yourself on those three to four day trips, like it's the same challenges. It's just, it's just doing it for a more extended period of time. Um, and then beyond that, it's, it's like mental. Um, and I think, you know, for me falling into that routine of, you know, it's not just a trip. You're living out there for a month and kind of establishing that routine and feeling like you can be comfortable was huge. Um, and I, I feel like I fell into a groove with it after a while. I don't know if that answers the question, if that's what they wanted to hear, but. Um... But yeah, being prepared, going out with and just going out with like ridiculously competent people too to support you. Like our team was great. Uh, I had someone here just mention uh, Matt Spence brought up the the program that I was thinking of it was Final Cut Pro for what else uh, people are using to edit. Um, Matt, here's here's a good one for you. <laughs> yeah. So the grand I total. You guys <laughs> there. I think I was about ten pounds. I think I set the record. I was seventeen pounds for the trip. So. But I think, I swear to God, like three or four pounds of that was just that mountain portage. Looking at photos of me before and after, I look gaunt after that, that portage. All right. Uh, so I guess we're kind of coming up on two hours here. So maybe we'll just take a couple more questions and then we'll kind of uh, clear this off. Uh I'm going to try to punch through some of these quick. So maximum days a two-person canoe can carry and provisions for two paddlers. We've done just over a month um, where our canoe has been able to take enough food for, for two people. Maybe if you had a longer canoe and you weren't doing uh, – that, that's in a 16-foot Skiff Canyon. Maybe if you had a longer canoe, you could, you could stretch that a little bit further uh, without having to do food drops or anything. But, like, would you say that that's kind of about – we're getting pretty close to tapping out at that point. I, I don't know. I feel like Frank Wolf has done 50 plus day trips unsupported in, in, in one canoe. Uh, yeah, that's impressive. That, that, that's going to take some serious packing. Yeah. It depends yeah. a bit on the style of canoe too, because those canyons have so much rocker. Your freeboard, in, like when we're loaded down at the start of the trip, the freeboard in the middle of the canoe is, is somebody made a comment about that earlier. It's not that much, but in a like a flatter prospector style, you do ride a little higher in the middle. Yeah. So it kind of depends on the canoe too. For sure. Another one here, which was tougher crossing the mountain, uh, doing the cutting or portaging the gear. I think like depends on the section that you were in. Sometimes uh, like at the beginning, Noah and Eric carried all that gear up the mountain. Like I, I think that would have been like one of the hardest parts of the entire thing. Uh, but at the same time, towards the end, I think all of our hands were pretty destroyed and just, just actually holding a tree to like saw was starting to get pretty painful towards the end. So yeah. I, I don't know if you guys would add anything to that. 
Yeah, I think diversity is key up there. Uh, you do one thing for a while and then you're just waiting for the next thing. Yeah. Um, you mentioned a couple of you guys hadn't met before. How did you end up finding each other and planning this trip? So Noah and I run this channel together and we grew up together and, and Noah, uh, how'd you meet, how did you meet Matt? I don't want to tell the story for you guys, but <laughs> that was kind of funny. Cause I wasn't, so Noah and I work at the same company now, but, uh, we didn't at the time that we met, but I, my buddy did. And he said, Hey, there's this guy that I work with and he likes to camp. You guys should probably hang out. And then we did. <laughs> that was about it. <laughs> we got was... along pretty well. <laughs> yeah. Uh, did any of you guys get sick of eating Noah's prop meal every day? <laughs> yes. I, I, I didn't, I didn't sign up to eat any of Noah's prop meal on this trip personally. Yeah. I so tapped I, out after a couple of days. Yeah. So I don't think anyone's ever really finished a bowl of prop meal other than me and Chris from the B2B uh expedition it, it's it's a big it's a big amount of food you really need to be committed to that i think the problem is the the bowl isn't capable of holding enough water to get it to an <laughs> edible consistency so it's like a mortar it's it like is. a bowl of it's mortar that you have to get down yeah but <laughs> uh how do you select your route what kind of resources do you use in researching your routes the, uh, i would say we we use cal topo it's an online free resource that you can make your own PDF packages of topographic maps. The biggest thing is look at an area that interests you and just start scrolling around. And then once you find a river or a geological feature or a lake that interests you, you just zoom in and figure out how you can get there how and how long it's gonna take to, to do that trip. And you sort of work backwards. So, so an add to that is, Another thing is there's a website, my CCR. My, is it my CCR? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my CCR.com. It's a website where, where other canoeists post their routes with a snapshot of, of how long it is, the difficulty, if there's rapids, there's portages, and a little trip report. And it's a great place to start looking is, is that website. Uh, all right, cool. Um... What gear upgrade would each of you look to do for your next trip? No, I think you mentioned paddles earlier and, and someone else had to ask, uh, why the cheap aluminum paddles? Uh, I'm just a cheap guy to be honest. <laughs> uh, but, but I, after that, after that, I realized after that trip, I, I bought myself a nice Werner paddle that I could have bought 10 aluminum paddles with. But the hope is uh, I, I will not get in another situation where I bust a paddle on a trip like this. Um, do you guys feel like filming takes away from the experience? With that being said, don't stop. I love your content. I, I don't. I don't feel like it does take away for the experience from me personally. Maybe the odd time when you're just like, I'd love to just kind of soak this in for a minute. We have to keep moving sometimes. But I would say that what trumps that is always coming back and having that footage after. Like I'm always thankful that I that I took those shots because having the memories for me it is definitely makes up for any uh, inconvenience along the trip. Yeah, yeah, and and we are filming, uh, but there's also a, a large part of the trip where we're not filming, and yeah, so we we still get those experiences when we're out there. Um. We've got a good one here. Have you guys looked into the traditional territories you camp on? I assume indigenous communities would have used different strategies to deal with travel in inhospitable conditions. So uh, I actually just got an email about this the other day, and, and it's something I want to address. We're, 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 um, we're going to be posting a full length version of this video series um, next week, um, just so that people don't need to watch it. And, episodic format and they if they want to just crush the whole thing they can watch it out something new that we're going to be trying um and in that i think we might make mention about the traditional land that we were traveling on because it's something that i, I started doing for the flow to james bay series and that's what they had commented on and it's something that we've been meaning to do more of in our videos but um I, it just honestly was a, a a mistake on our our behalf not including it in this one and is definitely something we want to be including and and, and recognizing 
in in our videos going forward. Um, so I'll bring this one up. When you finally found the trail after cutting your path over the mountain, did you wonder if you had wasted a ton of effort and had you? So that was definitely like the first thing that popped into my mind as soon as Noah and Eric surprised Matt and I with the, the news that they had found the portage trail. I just wanted to know, like, could we have avoided all this pain and struggle? But uh, no, like, Noah, do you want to speak to like what you, what you actually saw when you got to the other side? Yeah, so we, we came across and found that the portage trail, but we walked back and it, and it sort of disappeared in that big burn. And to be honest, after that, we didn't do, we didn't do too much more searching because we were, we were already in that position. And, um, we, we didn't find anything else on that, on that side of things. So. Yeah. I, I it, think the mentality was just moving. Point. We just had a mentality of like, let's move forward. I don't think we spent a lot of time dwelling on what could have been. Yeah. Uh, okay, we got a couple more here, and we can close this out. Uh, so I thought this one was a good one. Do we have a favorite quote from the Land of the Wild River series? I personally really like the one. I personally really like the one that I put at the very end of the series of Matt saying. <laughs> This trip was a bag of mixed nuts because he asked us to pull the camera out because he had one more final thought that he wanted to add to his 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 heartfelt speech at the end. And then he sat down and we filmed this moment for him. And then all he had to say was, I've got this trip was a bag of mixed nuts. <laughs> and I think that, that was like one of my favorite quotes of the entire trip. I mean, yeah, to be fair, that was a Noah quote from like two weeks earlier. So I can't yeah, yeah, yeah. credit it from that, but. I don't even know if it made the series, but I think one of my favorites was like, the, guys, do you see how fast the water floor is moving? That was a great. Oh, like, true. There's some great. I that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah Look how when fast we, when the we were zipping, floor. zipping down those, uh, zipping down those swifts. Um, yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> uh, what's what was more important? Coffee each morning or a great night's sleep? probably a great night's sleep in reality, but like if I woke up without a cup of coffee, I, I was going to be jonesing pretty hard, I think. Yeah. I'd say like both in equal measure. Uh, and on that same topic, was there a sleepy head in the group? At what time did you aim to hit the water each day? I would say that uh, Matt and Noah were in a much better swing of things than when Eric and I landed, but I, I would also say that Eric was probably the, the culprit for a sleepy head let's go with that because he's not here to defend himself he's not here to defend himself right now so that's perfect um and then we've got one question here on so the big question what's next so maybe i'll, I'll i can start this one so we do have something big in the works for this coming summer but we're not going to tell you guys tonight but there will be but stay tuned we, we will have some information coming to you guys we are very excited for this it should be another really fun one and uh in a new area and i guess just we, we're, we're getting quite a few questions in here uh about if we're expanding merch and uh i guess how to support us and stuff like that and we're, we we definitely are looking into to expanding this a little bit and seeing what other uh, things we can possibly offer. Um, and uh, I guess there'll be some more coming on that as well. So definitely appreciate that. And then I thought I'd finish it off with this. The Ontario Camping Couple saying, thank you for all you guys do. It's inspiring and educational. We really appreciate that. There was a lot of really nice comments on here tonight. Uh, definitely really appreciate uh, everyone uh, coming on tonight to hang out with us um looks like we still have 341 people in here with us so that's awesome and and thank you for all your questions and and, and definitely thanks for following along with all these series and uh, all your comments and everything are, are much appreciated anyone else have any final words before we sign off here uh just, just to echo that thank you so much for following along it it, it is really cool to see uh you guys enjoying uh this series and our other videos 
yeah, oh. I can't really say any more than that. It's been uh, it's been just really cool to see people's response to what you guys have put together here, and uh, just glad to be a part of it. Awesome. Well, thanks again, everyone. I uh, appreciate you uh, jumping on. And uh, with that, I think we are going to be signing off. So thanks again, everyone. And uh, have a great night. Are we still alive? I think we're still... <laughs>